We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and welcome to our webinar on sustaining your program after the Community Food Projects funding. My name is Sarah Lambertson and I'm the Community Food Projects Coordinator for New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. I'll be your host today and our presenters are Chris Brown from the Agricultural and Land-Based Training Association and Jennifer Hashley also from New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. I'm going to do a brief technical overview and a very short intro to New Entry. Jennifer will give more in, uh, information about New Entry when she speaks. And then Chris is going to talk about um, ALBA Organics Food Hub and dive into depth on that topic. Um, and then we're going to take questions for Chris right after his presentation. Then Jennifer will speak about examples of um, past CFP funding from uh, New Entry and how we've sustained that. And then we'll take questions for Jennifer and general questions at the end. So just a quick little introduction to New Entry, and again, you'll hear more about uh, New Entry when Jennifer speaks, but we um, are a nonprofit found based here in Massachusetts. We do on-the-ground work with farmers here in Massachusetts tra on training, um, new beginning farmers, and a lot of food access work. Uh, we also have national work providing support to organizations creating incubator farms, as well as interested in applying for CFP, Community Food Projects Grant, and the training and technical assistance grant um, that we have from the USDA to support CFP CFP applicants and grantees is a CFP uh, grant itself and is what allows us to do this webinar and the other um, resources that we're able to provide to applicants and grantees. Just a quick look at some resources that we have specifically for CFP. If you take a look at our website, we've got a lot of um, links to other helpful websites and resources as well as a lot of documents. We also offer one-on-one -on -one technical assistance for applicants and grantees, and this varies pretty widely, everything from the nuts and bolts of grants.gov all the way through um, understanding how to uh, implement a food hub if you wanted to speak to one of our TA providers who has a food hub, for example, Chris Brown. <laughs> um, we provide webinars as well, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Chris, who is going to do our first presentation. All right, Chris. So you are all set to begin. Everyone, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, Chris Brown, Executive Director of uh, Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association, which is a mouthful, so call us ALBA. Uh, we're in Salinas, California, and we work with farmers in the Tri-County area here on the Central Coast. and. Uh, it's a beautiful day in Salinas. I'm looking out on the San Lucia Mountains. And just over those mountains is the Pacific Ocean. It's a lovely area. Um, so we're going to talk about food hub sustainability. Um, and of course, sustainability um, implies that we're sustainable. We've mastered this whole thing, which uh, would be a bit of an exaggeration. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough deal, our particular experience. Um, it's a challenge, but it's, uh, we found that it's absolutely necessary part of our program. And what I've noticed in, in being a part of these webinars and talking to other organizations is that um, we kind of come at um, food, the food hub model from a different angle. Um, some are nonprofit, some are for profit, um, some are really oriented on providing, um, uh, you know, serving new market demand or providing um, consumer access to a healthier foods and food deserts. Um, our emphasis is is really on um, uh, from the farmer perspective. Our mission is to help um, low-income, largely Latino immigrant, um, aspiring farmers um, to establish their own um, organic family farms. So we're primarily, uh, as an organization, an educational, nonprofit educational institution. Um, but what we realized um, several years into the program is that without market access, um, these businesses just don't fly. It's really too much to expect of a beginning farmer, particularly one who may have limited English or even limited education to be able to um, learn all the, um, uh, you know, complexities of organic production in addition and the business compliance and business management in addition to a marketing your perishable produce. Um, and we all know that um, the market doesn't really serve the small farmer. It's, it serves the large industrial growers. So um, this became an essential element, basically one of our services, um, uh, not just a side activity, but part of our core service and uh, part of the organization. 
Um, we do a, a first year um, educational program um, for nine months, uh, prepare them on what it takes to launch a program, and then they have four years in the incubator. Where they start on a half acre, and we give them free technical assistance and subsidize access to land and equipment um, to help them get established and prepared for independent farming. And during this time, and even after, um, we continue to um, market the produce of our participants um, through our food hub um, called Alba Organics. Um, and uh, this is quite challenging, as we've learned. Um, uh, I recall here the tail that wags the dog, because it's become, um, I guess we've been kind of cursed with our own success. Um, once we really committed to this idea that, you know, marketing was a very important aspect um, to the success of our uh, program participants, um, and the participants in turn, um, saw that we could sell our goods, the thing just took off. I mean, it was $500,000 in 2008. We peaked at five and a quarter million um, in 2013. And uh, with that size came complexity, um, operational complexities, which I'm going to go into. So that's why I call it the tail that wags the dog, primarily educational institution. But really what we are now is um, uh, or our management time is largely devoted to, uh, to managing the food hub. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So, quick summary of uh, our layout here. Um, we have a 4,000 square foot cooler at our main facility uh, in Salinas. Um, this is also where we have 90 acres of uh, of land and where we train our farmers in the one year or the nine month education course before they launch their businesses in the incubator on our land. Okay. Hey, Chris, just a quick moment. This is Sarah. Um, your audio is coming in and out a little. If you don't mind just speaking uh -oh. a little closer to the microphone. Yeah, I will. I'll hold it next to my mouth. Great. Thanks so much. Is, is this better? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. So, yes, we have this 4,000 square foot cooler at our main facility in Salinas. Um, about half of that is cooled. It's far too small uh, for the uh, volume of produce that we have. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, farmers elect to market through Alba Organics or not, and several have really, um, you know, one developed a CSA, one or two, several do farmers markets, but really for their volume, most of them rely on, on Alba Organics because it's very difficult to market your produce in um, kind of not tiny quantities, but kind of medium quantities um, in the area. Uh, the industry definitely caters to the large farmers. Uh, they drop off a product, which, you know, can be, you know, uh, anywhere from 100 meters to 500 meters from their field. So it's quite convenient. And then we aggregate that and deliver most of the product um, in uh, two trucks to the San Francisco Bay Area, which is about 70 miles to 100 miles north of here. Um, and then when we're packed to the gills, we're also leaning on a third party cooler about 10 miles away in um, Salinas proper. Um, and as far as the sourcing, uh, we uh, in the past have sourced from 80 farmers. So that's probably going to be lower this year. Um, and 40 to 50 are current or past Alba farmers. Um, we need to get some product from outside farmers to satisfy our clients' needs. And where production is particularly low in the winter, we need to uh, pick up volume from the outside just to keep volume up and cover our costs. Um, Let's see. So, but about in total, about in the past, it's averaged about 80% of the produce that we market is from our current and former farmers. And uh, the price they get is a weighted, uh, well, it's basically an average. Um, each commodity uh, of all the transactions for any given commodity, we average them for the week. And then we give them, we take out a 24% fee and give them the rest. Okay. Um, as far as the, uh, um, Clients, we have uh, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. You recognize those. And then we do some organic uh, um, um, uh, wholesalers. And we're getting into Silicon Valley institutions and some educational institutions. And we're thinking about trying to get into the school districts as well. But we've yet to do that. Okay, here's our org structure. And this is for all of Alba. This is all 16 employees. Uh, the food hub, Alba Organics, is over to the left. And um, you see we have seven uh, employees there, and we have a line over to the bookkeeper, Wendy, um, who officially reports to the finance director, but um, is, is embedded or sits with the, uh, with the director of sales. And uh, two of these, uh, two of these uh, uh, employees are, are seasonal um, because, again, um, volume goes down um, over the winter. So uh, we, uh, we scale back on staff. Let's give you a second. 
Okay. So uh, the truth is out. We're still shooting uh, for sustainability. Um, we were heavily subsidized, especially in the early years, the infrastructure. Um, our, our current cooler is quite old now. In fact, I think it's 40 years old, but it was um, half financed by the Economic Development Administration, which is a good grant program for food hubs just trying to get started. Um, if you can make a um, credible claim that you are stimulating regional development, creating jobs, especially in distressed areas, um, they will pay for half. Um, you can finance the other half uh, however you want through donations, grants, or um, non-federal grants, or uh, find financing for it. Um, and operations were quite heavily subsidized early on, too, um, by USDA programs, other foundation grants. Um, and we got to, I mentioned the, the the sales um, spike starting in 2008. We really, when I came on board in 2012, um, the tone of the conversation with the board was such that, hey, this is something that can really create um, some profit for us so we can plow back into the program and reduce our reliance on grants. Um, and unfortunately that did not come to fruition. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the, the issues that came with size in a minute. But currently where it stands, uh, we have about a $2 million budget about half of that is the Alba Organics operations, where and we're um, generating about 900,000 in marketing and freight income. Um, so you know we have to cover the gap with about 100,000 dollars in subsidies. And this, this uh, again, this, this is uh, an estimate for this year. It's kind of changing because we made some um, um, some big changes in the last year, and I'll go over that in a second again. Okay, so profits have been elusive. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier, the higher sales brought higher fixed costs. Um, back in 2011, just before I arrived, you know, we had gotten up to about three million in sales, and it just was looking like our current cooler was not going to fit. So we went ahead and um, rented another one, uh, much larger, um, which solved some problems, but it um, created others. First of all, ten thousand dollars a month. Um, in, in rent, another 5000 or so in utilities. Um, complicated logistics, um, difficult to, uh, basically we're aggregating things here in Salinas, packing in a truck, unpacking it, and then repacking it in trucks. Then we have to staff two coolers and pay for also a driver to take it over there throughout the day. So again, uh, extra staff there too, which uh, bumped up the cost. One of the main things, though, was um, the guy who really drove all this growth, our GM, Tony, um, he, he was 30 miles away from the fields and the farmers. And this is in our business when you're working with, you know, 40, 50 plus another, you know, couple dozen outside growers. It is so key to be very, very in touch, especially with the, with the small, very new um, growers who are still kind of overwhelmed by the uh, – management of their their new farm and also you know behaving uh, according to the market rules of california as opposed to say mexico where you know people aren't so picky on how their produce looks perhaps and the level of consistency and quality is is not so strict um which brings up another issue uh when we got larger uh and had to move more volume quickly we started working more with wholesalers as opposed to the local retailers um, in their standards, even though they don't pay better prices, in fact, sometimes lower, um, their standards are much more strict. They're much more rigid. So um, breaking into that um, higher revenue um, range actually made business in that respect uh, tougher. So, yeah, we're working through that. Um, and then, you know, we're a nonprofit. So we're always looking for inexpensive solutions. We purchase software called um, Smart Turn which is inventory software, but it's inventory software that wasn't designed for the produce industry. And uh, we're kind of had a shoot from the hip uh, management um, style, but very capably, <laughs> capable person, but also you reach a certain size and a certain person staff structure that you need, you need uh, stronger systems and protocols and management. And uh, he was still um, kind of trying to do everything. Um, so that, that created a problem once we hit a certain volume. Um, and also created personnel turnover, um, finding uh, reliable people um, uh, that stayed with us was tough. And obviously, we're not paying top dollar, being a nonprofit. Um, I think I touched on the clients, right? Had, oh, 
yeah, higher volume meant bigger and more demanding customers. I, I mentioned that. Um, keeping those customers is also made difficult by virtue of how we sort this product, right? Multiple small farmers, um, everyone has to come to the table with their part of the, as I say, jigsaw puzzle. If not, we have an incomplete jigsaw puzzle, or in other words, an, uh, an incomplete order. And, and, you know, there's only so many times you can get away with that with Whole Foods before they close the door. So we're constantly dealing with, you know, doors opening and shut. Um, and when they shut, then you go to further afield customers, um, they're looking to uh, maybe have a less product, take it out of state, and the chances of us having difficulty on arrival with quality issues goes much, much higher. So these are the things we're dealing with um, in our model. And I mentioned the last 12 months, there have been particularly um, big changes. Um, last year, we're still on an upswing. You know, in 2013, uh, we had had our, we'd peaked at five and a quarter million wanted, we're looking for about 10% growth on top of that. So getting near 6 million, um, we hired a new sales rep to allow Tony to more, you know, management space. So he's not on the phone so much. We figured this is going to accommodate our growth. Um, but Tony had warned us too. He was looking to go back to farming and indeed he did, um, and started making that transition in midsummer. And, uh, the uh a lot of pressure was put on the new sales person and um it just didn't turn around um very fast and uh, when tony left we put him in the interim gm position going into the slow season because we didn't feel like we could uh hire another person i have a gm and sales person um during the slow months and uh, things just didn't take so we opened up the recruiting again and uh hired um two people from the private sector and uh, they've been here with us since January, and we also purchased a new inventory software system, which we're implementing now. So we're we're still recovering from last year, um, finally launching the software um, this month, um, and uh, you know, kind of digging ourselves out of a hole. In the end, uh, last year, rather than having a, a, a gain in sales, we actually um, declined by about nine hundred thousand, and that, that equates to about two hundred thousand in. Um, in gross profit. So that was a big hit and we're still kind of digging out of that. Um, so in the year ahead, um, this is what we're looking at. Um, implementing the uh, inventory management software, um, executing a master crop plan for the first time ever. That is, you know, we're going to reduce the number of overall products and stagger them so we have a consistent flow of product. And that's something that's particularly challenging for us, but really important. Um, to be able to, to maintain our client relationships. And we've got to secure up to 150 acres of production, um, about 60% on our land, 40% off, uh, hoping to rely heavily on, on our alumni partnerships and um, really nail down our cooler operations. Um, we're still exploring a cooler expansion project too, uh, hopefully doubling or tripling our cooled space, um, potentially incentivizing um, alumni and other farmers um, by lowering our 24% fee uh, so they bring more product in and potentially outsourcing our fleet or just outsourcing delivery altogether to simplify the operations as much as possible. And I mentioned the selling to school districts too as a consideration. And uh, just some keys to sustainability here. I think I'm running at about 15 minutes. I'll go through this in just one minute. I mean, these are pretty obvious. Um, I, I started this presentation thinking, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do the key success factors sort of thing, but I think it's far more uh, illuminating for people from the outside, not to you know kind of read a textbook to, you know sort of slide presentation, but rather um, kind of ex uh, learning from our mistakes and our experiences. But indeed, here's a few points <laughs> that I'd say are key, and, and this all revolves around good flow of product, knowing what's coming well ahead of time. Um, selling it well ahead of even, it even being planted um, by developing programs with with, with clients and, and then uh, executing, um, getting the order fulfillment right through strong uh, quality control in the field and at the cooler and uh, having really strong um, farmer coordination. Um, and of course, involved in that is the handling and the logistics, um, simplify as much as possible, um, have the adequate equipment, obviously, in space but also the personnel who really can think out of the box and, uh, and, and make sure things are getting rotated. Um, 
all the inventory is getting in the system, losses are minimized, and ultimately um, that right product is getting on the truck to make the uh, clients happy. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, Sarah, you want to open it up to questions? Yeah, so at this point, um, we can take any questions that uh, you all have for Chris. So the first one is, um, any suggestions for simple software for beginning micro food hubs uh, consignment projects um, less than $10,000 a year? Yeah, well, we're, ju we're just experimenting with, with ours now. It's something called Profit Pro Pack, um, and we can't even give you a whole lot of input on it, although it, it we did talk to a person or two about um, their use of it. It does seem to be more oriented for, for the smaller food hub. Um, in all, it costs us something like $30,000 to get set up. The software alone was 11, but then um, the uh, technical assistance, we uh, it goes along with it. We had to buy a new server too and get that set up. So the upfront cost is considerable. The um, service cost, um, I believe is uh, around 200, 250 a month. All right. Any other questions out there for Chris? Hello. Uh, go, go ahead. Yeah, Chris, this is Reginald Fagan. I'm, I'm calling you from uh, the Los Angeles area. Hi, and, Reginald. Uh, uh, yeah, how you doing? I was up on the Central Coast. I was in San Luis Obispo, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm back down in L.A. And uh, we run a resource center. Uh, we're in the process of setting up a, a food co-op, and we'd like to try to see how can we connect with you to try to see about getting your product into our food co-op. We're covering Compton, South Central L.A. Uh, you would call Lou Fierro. Um, at, uh, you can start with the number that's on the screen. Um, okay. Or at 758-5958. He's the director of sales. Okay, sounds good. Because we have a lot of restaurants also, independent restaurants, that we're trying to get them to consider, you know, supporting small farmers as opposed to going through the larger brokers. Understood. And thanks for your interest. Okay, thank you, Chris. So any other specific questions for Chris? We'll have a chance to answer uh, more general questions again at the end, but if there's anyone has questions now um, before we move on to Jennifer's, um, and Chris won't be available at the end of the presentation, so um, if you do have one that comes up later, feel free to reach out to me or to Chris, but um, this is the chance to get Chris. All right. Well, Chris, I want to give you a big thank you, um, and uh, I appreciate your time here, and we are going to hand it over to Jennifer for the next presentation. Thanks, everyone. You can always email me if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Chris. All right, Jennifer, you should be all set to go. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Hashley. I'm the director of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project, and I'm assuming you can hear me. Is that right, Sarah? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, perfect. Um, so just a little bit about New Entry. Um, we're a partnership project between the Tufts University's Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy and the Agriculture, Food, and Environment Program, and we're also fiscally sponsored by Third Sector New England, and I just mentioned that because it is part of um, how we've been able to sustain our programming over time. Um, the organization was started out of the university, but um, a lot of funders don't want to fund university systems, so it's been to our advantage to have um, a nonprofit community-based partner um, as a conduit for our funding because we do have very diversified funding, which I'll talk about. So if anyone has any questions about fiscal sponsorship and operating between several multiple entities, we can certainly get into that at the end. Um, it's not without its challenges, but it does offer some advantages as well. Um, we also have a lot of collaboration 
with a lot of partners and um, our original mission focused exclusively working with immigrant and refugee farmers who wanted to get into agriculture. And that audience um, expanded in 2007 as the local food movement was starting to grow and take off. And now we serve um, pretty much the entire range of demographics, both immigrant, refugee, U.S.-born, American farmers of all stripes, um, veterans, retirees, career changers, uh, young people, um, anyone and everyone who um, wants to get into a commercial farming operation. So we really think of ourselves as a farm incubator. We're trying to diversify um, who is engaged in farming and um, also fostering food justice through a lot of our food access initiatives. So I'll talk about some of that in a minute. But I just wanted to start out thinking about long-term program sustainability. Um, I always kind of think of, you know, start with the big picture in mind. What's the big vision and mission of your organization and the values? And then that kind of gets, as we all know in strategic planning, helps you narrow your focus around how you're going to accomplish what you're doing. And hopefully that can also drive all of the um, types of funding that you might be looking for to both start and sustain your programs over time. So thinking big picture and then moving yourself down into the, the programmatic areas I think is a really helpful way to, to begin thinking about it. And so how we've organized that at New Entry is just trying to understand how our mission, vision, and values inform the different program buckets um, that we work on. So our main, um, main mission is to help you know, diverse farmers get in to the business of farming and sustain that over time. There are a lot of challenges to entering the business of farming, so we've really centered our programs um, around and when you try to whittle it down into a nice graphic, um, given the diversity of things we do, we've sort of boiled it into this little format here where we're really working on a lot of capacity building projects, um, helping build agricultural skills, information, and knowledge among new producers, helping those producers get access to the resources they need through with farmland, access to capital and credit, the types of infrastructure to run their businesses, and then that is all hinges on whether they can um, develop a viable enterprise through having diversified markets and revenues. So when all those things come in and they have, farmers have the capacity, resources, and, and market-driven approach, hopefully that will create more successful farmers, more food out there, and improve food security. So that's our real goal um, with our program, and that helps determine the types of programming that we offer. That's all, um, all of those things also help build sort of the foundation <clears throat> of our other programs that we've developed. Um, as we've been in this business for a while, a lot of people end up calling up and asking us to, you know, share our strategies for how did you start this program or how did you develop that program. So we uh, built that into our, our some of our national programming, our National Incubator Farm Training Initiative and other consulting projects that we do to help other organizations. It also, I feel like being on the ground doing active community-based programming um, helps us um, do a better job of advocacy and, and address particular issues um, in the sector. So this is a snapshot of all the different programs that New Entry offers and runs. Um, and the ones that I've circled are programs that we started with community food projects funding. I'll go into these in a little bit more detail, but just um, some of the detail around our capacity building programs, as I mentioned, um, we do an Explore Farming course to help folks understand um, their own interest and um, readiness to start a farm business. If they're not quite ready yet, we have a farm employment directory that we um, offer and maintain. Um, it's an interactive map and we do a print guidebook um, to help people get jobs on farms. Um, and then our core program is around our firm business planning courses. We offer four courses a year, two in the classroom, two online. And that's how we're actively every year bringing new people into the program, helping them establish a strong foundation um, in their first year startup farm business plan and, and put their thoughts on paper in multiple different formats of a business plan. Um, and then we also offer practical skills training series throughout the season, um, both on our incubator farms in crop production, and we partner with the Tufts Vet School to do livestock um, field days and programming around animal husbandry. Throughout all of that, and you'll see the theme, um, we provide a lot of technical assistance and support in those areas around um, helping them gain the skills and knowledge that they need. The other big piece is the infrastructure piece, as I mentioned. Um, access to land is a huge challenge, especially in our urbanized um, eastern Massachusetts communities. So we run three incubator training farm sites um, where we provide people access to land on our training sites for up to three years. And then we help them um, connect to land off the incubators once they leave um, through our land matching service. And that helps do outreach in a broad range of communities, identifying available farmland and landowners and connecting the two. 
We also provide access to credit and capital through partners, through Farm Service Agency and other organizations that do lending to farmers, and we also have our own um, microloan program through our World Peace Food Hub um, to producers that are participating in that. They can get an advance payment on their, um, their crops um, at the start of the season. We also provide some infrastructure support where we can. Again, our incubator sites are um, filled with coolers and equipment and um, greenhouses and irrigation systems and wash stations, so that helps folks access that infrastructure. We also do um, advising to folks if they're looking to buy their own equipment, make recommendations, help them understand what would be useful. One piece of the infrastructure component that we manage is our mobile poultry processing unit, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, that was one of our community food projects um, programs that we uh, were able to receive funding for as well, and ongoing technical assistance. Um, the access to diversified markets and enterprise piece mostly centers around our World Peace Food Hub that I'll talk about. We run a multi-farm CSA, service low-income markets um, and institutions, and we also help connect farmers to local farmers markets and all the support services that go along with that, whether it's accessing um, coupon programs and registering for that or being a, a SNAP vendor, um, helping them uh, develop a website, uh, banners for their market stalls, um, whatever the case may be, we provide a lot of support. And then as I mentioned, we also like to collaborate and network and share our work. So we run a statewide beginning farmer network and we provide the training curriculum for the Urban Farming Institute of Boston, which is an urban farming training program, so we run their training programs for them. We also run our National Incubator Farm Training Initiative, which supports incubator programs across the country. And we're getting ready to launch a new um, national nationwide program called Farmer Corps to help bring together farm apprenticeship programs, beginning farmer programs, incubator programs, university-based beginning farmer programs, and hopefully elevate the work that we're all doing. So our organizational capacity, um, we're at about a million dollar budget. Um, most of this is salaries and benefits to staff, as you can imagine. Um, this is our roster of staff and who does this work. Um, we rely on a lot of um, multi-tiered positions, um, which I'll get into in, in a little bit. And we just brought on yesterday um, three new AmeriCorps VISTA members that were very excited to have that additional capacity. One of the advantages of being part of a university system is that we have ready access to very highly qualified food systems oriented graduate students at Tufts and we can um, hire them very cheaply through federal work study funding. Um, and we uh, really take advantage of that additional capacity to sustain our programs over time and to do the work um, of many more people than, than we can do on staff. Um, one thing about our structure that is not um, uh, very <laughs> lean and mean as we like to think that we are as an organization, but we are supporting two offices, um, one at Tufts and one here in Lowell, plus all of our three incubator farm sites are in three different locations with three sets of infrastructure that to support and maintain and put insurance and rent and other things into, and we have a separate food hub warehouse space that we rent. So in my ideal situation, we would be on one gigantic farm, so sort of like Alba, and have all of our land and infrastructure and food hub and office space in one spot, but we are scattered around with a lot of different um, pieces to this. So that does certainly impact long-term sustainability. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail around this, but this is just how our revenue breaks down and where it comes from because uh, we're really working on Again, continuing to build um, our social enterprise components and earned income components and individual contributions to hopefully in the future rely less on government grants. I am uh, thankful that we are moving in this direction. We used to be about 80% grant funded, so we've worked very hard. Um, I mean, even still, it's about 77% if you count all grants, but mostly 80% government grant funded, and as that has become more challenging, uh, we've worked really hard to diversify where that funding is coming from. And where does the money go? As you can imagine, um, mostly staff. That's your biggest expense usually in most um, organizations. A large percentage of our budget goes back to the farmers through our World Peace Food Hub um, farmer payments. We pay them a uh, fair living wage price for their produce. We keep about 20 to 22% um, uh, commission on that, so the rest goes to them. And then um, other fees as well, indirect being uh, higher, as I mentioned, with all the overhead. So this is uh, just some funding streams, again, grants, a lot of federal, state, local foundation grants, making sure you have good mission alignment. Uh, we do some fundraising. We do an annual appeal twice a year. We have some individual donor cultivation. Um, we do an event. Um, we try not to do a lot of events because the return on investment can be challenging, but we do one big 
fundraising dinner. Um, it's very small, actually, but we charge a lot for tickets, $500 a plate or $1,000 for the wine table, and that raises about twenty. $25,000 a year for our low-income food access work. Um, we haven't gotten into sponsorships at this point yet. That's a new area we're hoping to expand with um, our AmeriCorps VISTA capacity. Um, we've tried to work on our fee-for-service ratio and, and fill out how we can collect more revenues from the clients that we're serving. That's a challenge, as I'm sure many of you face, working um, with communities that don't have a lot of resources. Um, it's hard to, to squeeze more out of folks that are already struggling that you're trying to serve. So that hasn't really been a huge growth area. And then just trying to build different, um, our social enterprise with our food hub. Um, you know, we had glorious expectations, sort of like you heard from Chris, that um, we're going to really blow this food hub out of the water and, um, you know, generate revenues to support other areas of the organization. And we're really trying to stay true to our mission of why we started the food hub, which is to provide living wage markets to our farmers and help them market their product. So we're not just a general aggregator distributor for anyone, um, which is already you know, also a low income margin uh, business. But um, sticking to that mission, it's kept our food hub relatively small and focused. So that hasn't been a huge growth area um, for revenue. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with all the different grants out there, but just wanted to post this up here. It'll obviously be on the recorded slide. You can look through it a little later, but um, we've tapped into almost all of these different types of programs over the years. Um, they come and go, as you know. They're one-year or multi-year funding. Um, you're all um, interested potentially in the Community Food Projects piece, but um, we've been able to dovetail our programming into you know getting funds from BFRDP and Risk Management Agency because of our audience working with immigrants and refugees for so many years. We um, received funding from the 2501 program. We've also taken advantage of the new Farmers Market Promotion Program and Local Foods Promotion Program. Specialty crop block grants in your state are great. So is the SARE, Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program. We've helped farmers get farmer grants. We've done research and education grants, community partnership grants, and professional development grants. So we've tapped into all of those different types of programmings over the years in our region. There are also regional integrated pest management grants. That might be something you could um, integrate into your program. NRCS has conservation innovation grants. We've applied three years in a row, gotten past the pre-proposal stage, and have not yet gotten funding from that. But I know other programs who have, so that might be something that would work for you. Um, if you're in a rural area, the RBEG grants are a good opportunity, value-added producer grants, depending on what you're looking at. Um, and if you, in particular, in the past, um, I don't think this program is winding down, but the Refugee Agricultural Partnership Program has gotten a lot of groups off the ground as well. And I'm sure there are many others um, people can mention in the in the question and answers at the end. So those are government grants, but for foundation grants, just my little inset there, um, you know, just make sure that there's good mission alignment, the program area, and really the key to getting those foundation grants is to get to know the program officers, cultivate them, invite them to your events if you can. Um, some of them will fund capital and infrastructure, which can be a really difficult thing to fund through any of these other federal grants. So we've really tended to use foundation grants to help us um, get some more of that capital and infrastructure funding and to fill in some of the gaps or to keep programs going over time once um, federal grants end. All right, so fundraising. Um, this is always something people wonder if they should invest their time in to sustain some programs. Um, we found it's a challenge. Um, I always try to really keep in mind the return on your investment of your staff time and the money it's going to cost you to put on an event. So for our annual donor event, as I said, um, we have a very targeted mission about what we're going to raise the money for. It's um, pretty low input. It takes a little bit of my time and a little bit of a development person's time to help organize the event. We have a great restaurant and chef. They do all the work. We just try to sell the seats and show up and put a program together. And um, and it's pretty easy money. It's it's not a huge event. Again, it's you know anywhere from 30 to 40 people, but it's a high ticket event that brings in a nice chunk of change with very low um, staff time involved. Um, same with our annual donor appeal. We do two mailings a year and try to you know do some email solicitations as we um, as we schedule that. Uh, we just started participating in a local bikeathon. Our Greater um, Lowell Community Foundation um, does all the organizing of the bike event, and it's set up for nonprofits to just walk in, register, 
and then each of their riders on a team. This picture here was our new entry team last year. It was pretty small. Um, we didn't get all of our riders in because they were coming in at different times. Um, but we each pay $50 rider fee, and then any funds that each of your riders raise for you all comes back to the nonprofit, which is a great way to do it without having to organize an entire event yourself. We're also collaborating on, um, I don't know if other states have special license plates, but a unique thing in Massachusetts is we have um, an opportunity as a charity to um, promote a special license plate for our cause. So we did not have a food and ag plate in Massachusetts. So we, um, New Entry, partnered with a Federation of Farmers Markets and as a way to support our Beginning Farmer Network, which is a statewide organization of over 40 different service providers, are launching this Choose Fresh and Choose Local license plate. So once we get 1,500 paid registrations, um, we're at about 700 right now, this will go to the registry. We'll have to put up a $100,000 bond and within two years sell another 1,500 plates for a total of 3,000. The bond is released and then every time someone renews, we renew our registration every two years, um, the full $40 of the extra plate fee comes to our organization. So hopefully our goal is that in a few years when there's lots of these plates on the road, we'll have about $100,000 coming in of unrestricted income to support our programs. And then we've also, because we run a food hub, um, been tapping our CSA members, the ready audience, the folks who are already giving to buy products from our farmers, um, to uh, do fundraising with them. So this year we, um, we've always had sort of a please write in your extra uh, donation toward our low income food access program and this year we had a, um, a specific program area where people could buy a special low income share. It was their regular share plus additional funding on top of um, of the money that they were already paying. And we had a pretty high rate of participation from our existing CSM, CSA members to do that. So that's been bringing in extra revenues for that program. So then the fee-for-service piece, um, this is, as I said, a small part of what we do, but we do charge course tuition. These look like high numbers, but it includes, you know, a nine-week program, unlimited technical assistance, and all of the field training workshops for that one-time registration fee. The caveat here is that almost 80% of our participants are on scholarships, so they pay a sliding scale anywhere from $50 or $80 on up to the $500 or $400, depending on the class they're taking. So we're not really collecting as much there as um, could be if everybody was paying the full rate. Um, any drop-ins to our training workshops pay a small fee. Our livestock workshops are full day with lunch, so they're generally around the $45 range. These are just some of our other consulting services. A few years ago, we added a, techni a required technical assistance fee to our incubator farm program because some of our funding um, disappeared, so we wanted a way to, to collect some, some buy-in from our farmers. We're out there 40 hours a week providing one-on-one -on -one support to them on their farms. We felt that had value and that they should cover that cost, so folks are doing that as well. And then if anyone wants custom tractor services, we charge for that. But as I said, our income uh, from our incubator farm does run at a deficit. It does need to continual support. Um, our MPPU, our mobile poultry processing unit, also doesn't exactly cover its own costs, but we do charge a rental fee for that as another fee-for-service model. So to get more specific, um, New Entry has had about five different community food projects funding over the years, and I just want to talk a little bit about how we've worked to sustain those programs in the context of all of our other work. Um, so our very first um, major grant, federal grant for the project before I arrived um, was really called the Lowell Food and Farm Project. It was a community food projects grant early on when the, the program was just getting off the ground. It launched our core incubator farm training program and really got um, our organization off the ground. So it helped us build the partnerships, establish our farmer mentoring program, get our first group of immigrant and refugee farmers on the land, make connections for them, start to think about marketing, um, and start to, we also had some funding in that grant to help them deliver some of their um, culturally appropriate food to our local food bank. Um, so that was uh, an initial core funding program, and as I've said, we've done all kinds of different strategies over the years to, to keep that going. And then I'll talk about these others as we go through, but um, shortly after we started that program, we um, launched our, our 
we realized and recognized a strong need that marketing was a huge issue and barrier for our farmers. So we really wanted to help them come together and sell as a group. So we got another Community Food Projects grant for an entirely separate project, which was to create our cooperative marketing structure and strategy, which has now evolved into a food hub um, as the terminology changes over the years. But we used that project to launch um, a lot of farmer education about what cooperatives were, how it could work, um, the legal structure, operations, market development, all of that. And then um, as we got you know, later on, in 2008, we applied for our first mobile poultry processing unit grant through CFP. We applied for three straight years in a row. So any of you out there who have applied to a CFP grant and didn't get it the first time, keep trying. Um, and you know how hard it is. Every year you put in a huge proposal, you've got to chase all the 100% matching dollars. But we didn't give up. We felt like it was a great project. Um, they kept telling us, well, we feel like this is more of a program for a risk management agency to fund or this other organization to fund. And they weren't quite ready to do it. And then the third year we applied, I got a, a call from Liz tucker -Manty saying, we have a little bit of extra money. A project wasn't able to meet their match. You know, would you do it for 45000 And I said, sure. <laughs> of course, you don't turn money down. So we did a very... Um, truncated demonstration project for that money, but we were glad we finally got, um, got funding for it. And then as we were engaging in other types of work in our community, as we all do, um, we had received some funding from another group to do a community um, food assessment in Lowell. And out of that community food assessment project, which usually is funded by community food projects, but we got some funding from a different um, organization and launched, um, realized that we wanted to do a, a further study of urban food production in Lowell, and so we got a CFP planning grant to do that. And now we're working on our technical assistance grant. So how we've sustained these programs, as I mentioned, our first CFP grant started our incubator farm program. This is just a little bit of our overview of our costs. Um, you know, we had an outreach and recruitment person, but right now the staffing that we need to continue to keep funded is our farm manager, who also doubles as a technical assistance coordinator, who is responsible for um, a lot of all of the on-the-ground physical work on the farm and the mentoring and coaching and training of the farmers. So there's just a lot of staffing that goes into that um, and the hard costs that we incur from land rental fees, porta potties, um, utilities, um, lease fees with the you know the landlord's insurance. All those things are hard out of pocket costs. Plus fixing the equipment and machinery and putting fuel in the tractors and the trucks and things like that. And you can see with all of those costs, we don't bring in that much money from rental fees. So we've um, to to fund some of the infrastructure pieces, we've reached out and taken advantage of cost share programs through NRCS, through EQIP, um, and through the Agricultural Management Assistance um, Program to get irrigation dollars to put in our wells and our pumps, um, underground conveyance lines, things like that. We also got a University of Massachusetts Extension had a pilot project for a corn heater for our greenhouse, so we took advantage of that. And as I mentioned before, we go to a lot of foundations for capital equipment. And in any of our grants, we always incorporate a training supplies line item. And that training supplies line item in our budget generally pays for some of the hard capital outlays, not capital, but just supply money that um, may go into the training component of the incubator farm. And as I said, here's just a quick breakdown of the fees that we collect um, and what it includes. You can certainly spend more time with that later. It's also on our website. But this is our attempt to try to collect those fees to support that program. And um, you know, as you can imagine, we we charge fifty-five dollars a season. You know, maybe we'll have anywhere from ten to fifteen growers. They don't all choose to pay for a pesticide fee, but we can easily spend a couple thousand dollars on organically approved pesticides every year. So um, it's a it's a factor of trying to recoup some of those costs, but not trying to to overcharge the farmers to make them not have a success. With our second um, CFP grant, um, our Immigrant Farming Marketing Cooperative, which has become our World Peace Food Hub, one of the first things that we did, we knew that we needed to get off grant funding for this. We, we felt like it was a quasi-business model. Um, we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to run it as a business to the extent that we could to demonstrate to the farmers um, good management around marketing and enterprise development. So the, one of the first key pieces that we brought in when we first got our CFP grant was um, partnering with our local 
uh, Brandeis University has in their Heller School MBA program um, has these team consulting projects. So we brought a group of students in to help us develop a business plan to achieve financial sustainability for this project. And they ran a bunch of numbers and helped us plan as we were getting started. And um, we were really happy that we actually followed the plan and broke even in, in 2010 right on time. So all the strategies that they helped us think about and that we were able to actually implement um, paid off. And I can talk, I'll talk about it on the next slide, how that's, our models shifted a little bit, but we did a second project with them in 2014 um, because we've expanded significantly into the low-income food access piece, and that's really changed our business model. We wanted to be able to do more analysis of that component and how to think about if we're going to shift from more retail to wholesale, how that can help, um, how we can think about business models around that. So I've got a lot of great suggestions. But we also relied heavily on a lot of other in-kind support. And when we were starting, we thought we were originally going to start to develop a cooperative structure. So we engaged in a lot of planning with the Cooperative Development Institute. We were hoping maybe we could develop a um, heifer project where because they only fund farmer-led grassroots-based projects. Um, but um, unfortunately, the farmer group that we were working with really were reticent about um, legally incorporating into a formal organizational structure. So over the years, we've been back and forth about this, but the Food Hub has just really remained a program of new entry. Um, and that's fine with us at this point, but um, it, it wasn't originally designed at that, as that. So we thought we were going to develop different structures and we're bringing in different partners around that. Um, and market diversification has been a huge part of how we've sustained this program um, after we launched it with CFP money is um, the CSA model was a very small part when we first started and we were focusing more on some wholesale and restaurant sales and um, institutional things and, and really the CSA model took off and, we'll, and that was really the growth area for a long time. And then as we started feeling like, geez, here we are helping um, low-income farmers sell their product to a, more of a middle to upper income clientele um, and we knew that food access was important to the farmers and to our mission, um, we started looking more at that and so it's changed our business model a little bit. But other um, grant support that have helped fund different aspects of the Food Hub over the years, again, specialty crop block grant, um, we focused that around specialty crops production and production issues. Um, we've gotten risk management funding to focus specifically on food safety concerns related to the Food Hub sales. We've gotten some FISMIP funding to help us do more market analysis to look at transitioning to wholesale from CSA, looking at institutional sales. Local Foods Promotion Program, again, similar um, kind of thing with different emphasis. Again, you can't go back to the same federal funders for the same programming, so we always continue to tweak new areas that we want to explore and expand. And then other foundation funds over the years have helped fill some gaps. But right now, our, our food hub is about around $300,000 in sales, and of that, about $75,000 helps cover our actual operating costs of staff time and programming and things like that. And we started very modestly in 2005, the last 10 years, we've grown from you know, $7,000 to over three hundred. We're not a $5 million organization like ALBA, but it's a different scale. Um, we did break even and, and covered our costs in two years, in 2010 and 2011, but we've been operating at a deficit since 2012 because we moved from literally a circus tent on our incubator farm to a 2,000 square foot warehouse. We now have two refrigerated trucks. We have to pay that rent year round. Um, and we've, as I said, we've really expanded our food access mission. Um, and now we're serving folks who can't pay the upper to middle income price of a CSA. And the CSA market in our area has really flattened. We've seen a lot of uh, farms, a lot more farms come online, which is a great thing. Um, but And customer buying preferences are shifting, and we haven't seen that as a huge growth area. We were on a trajectory of pretty much doubling CSA share membership for a long time, and we've really flattened out at around um, 400 shares. We haven't been able to sell more than that, and then this year we didn't even reach that goal. So that's becoming a, a challenge. As I mentioned, our other grant, the Mobile Poultry Processing Unit, the unit itself, just to clarify, was funded um, with rural development funding, our RBEG grant, um, some state innovation funds through our Department of Ag, and we uh, matched that with a lot of private fundraising. So that paid for the actual unit and the equipment. What we, um, as I said, took several tries with CFP funding was really to do a pilot demonstration project. We wanted to help the farmers um, that we were training, new farmers, 
um, understand what it was like to raise um, a couple different breeds of broilers under a couple different um, growing situations. We trialed a couple different pens, a Joel Salatin style pen, these hoop coops that you see here. And we really wanted to promote it to new and beginning farmers as a way to diversify their income um, in addition to a vegetable enterprise. And we wanted to train urban backyard poultry folks in Lowell because we have a lot of um, Southeast Asian community in Lowell and they um, are very, were very interested in poultry production. So wanted to invite them out to learn more about that and to connect um, the food with the low income communities and try to figure out what the price points would be to make um, high quality protein available to all income levels. So that was really the focus of that CFP grant. Um, we've been able since to sustain that by incorporating the mobile poultry processing unit and, and the resource manuals and things we developed through CFP into our overall livestock training. We also received other funding to develop an online um, MPPU training course, which is free to producers, but that was something else we were able to get grant funding for to then continue to um, operate the unit. Um, and we do, as I said, charge a fee to rent the unit. Um, we have an annual hands-on physical training with the unit that we charge for. Um, the fee-for-service helps maintain it when things break. Um, but it doesn't really co um, cover the staff oversight and management. So right now, we're actually, we don't have a livestock coordinator. He just left um, to work for another organization, and we haven't replaced it because we're waiting to hear from some other funding. So we have hired a contractor who is a user of the unit to manage it. So that works pretty well because he has a vested interest in keeping it up and running for his own use. Um, but he's, he's kind of, we're basically, he's, we're invoicing him for the use, and then he's invoicing us for his time to manage it with other producers. Our other um, CFP grant was a planning grant. Again, I said building on this coalition, we were part of food and farm and hunger groups in Lowell, and we did a community food assessment. And um, interestingly enough, this is just how things evolve in close-knit communities. Uh, one of the farmers who graduated from our program, the new entry program, she went off and started a farm and then wanted to come back to grad school here, so we hired her to help do the community food assessment. Um, so as a student, she was getting credit, and we were helping pay for her degree to do that through the funding. So she did that, um, and then she ended up uh, spinning off and starting um, a whole new nonprofit in Lowell, Mill City Grows, which is a great program here. Um, and while that was happening, we were doing this community food projects um, planning grant around urban food production planning. So she was obviously in the thick of it. And we contracted with the Conway School of Planning and Urban Design in Western Mass to help us. They do a, another student project and do these really beautifully well-researched and thought-out reports. Um, so we hired them and another organization, Metabolic Labs, to um, put together an interactive project planning website. So how we've sustained all of that work, as I said, um, a new organization sort of grew out of that. So luckily, New Entry has not had to carry the torch um, around urban farming and, and the recommendations that came out of the report. We spawned a whole other organization that started, and now um, a bunch of other groups are continuing to um, carry forward the conversation and, um, and manage the website. So we've been able to sort of divest ourselves of being the leadership for this program in, in the community. And then um, we also are now doing our national TA grant, and it's been able to leverage our national incubator farm training work. Our same kind of intake and referral process is happening. We already had a good network of partners, so continuing to provide this kind of education, webinars, one-on-one -on -one support, add some evaluation and metrics um, work, survey data collection, and then um, as a way to sustain this, we hope that the USDA will continue to keep the TA funding in there, and then we will just put our hats in the ring again when the funding um, expires and hope it will get renewed to continue to um, sustain this program. So just to let you know um, a little bit about our own capacity for development activities, it's um, a good chunk of my time. Um, our program and finance coordinator helps me with grant proposal development and um, she also manages our food hub, so she does a lot of the proposal writing for that. As I said, we just brought on yesterday some new AmeriCorps VISTA members, so um, we'll have the capacity building, um, capacity building support of one of those folks. We've been lucky in recent years to receive a little bit of time from our Tufts Advancement Department, which is kind of new, which has been great. So they are funding our annual appeal mailing, um, and then he provides some logistical support for our donor dinner and helps with um, donor cultivation, which is great because that's never been a big part of our program. And they do process all of our gifts acknowledgement and do some stewardship activities in context of the whole university. So that's a really huge value add that we get by being part of that, um, even though there's 
no direct funding that we get from the university, having that little bit of their advancement time um, really makes a big difference. Um, and then I expect all staff to kind of help where needed in terms of development activities and keeping programs going. And then our donors themselves are, um, you know, our best advocates out there to other donors. So if I were going to sum up everything and, and give a few tips around sustaining programs in general, um, as I said at the start, um, building whatever your community food projects, you know, succinct idea is, if you can think about it in the context of your overall organization and long-term strategic planning, I think that goes a long way to helping you and your board and other stakeholders figure out how this can be leveraged um, and leverage those partnerships for the long haul. And those partnerships are really, have been really key and important to us in maintaining a lot of our programs. I feel like we also have to be very creative with our job descriptions in these kind of organizations, you know, finding really good quality staff, doing what it takes to build their professional skills and development, invest in them, and, um, you know, be a good steward of their interests as well so they stay around um, and work hard. And, you know, we've just had to ask people to wear multiple hats as we've gotten partial funding for particular programs or funding has come and gone and we get new funding in other areas, you know, people's job descriptions become a patchwork of many different types of, of tasks and activities. Um, we've tried hard over the years to help focus those job descriptions, but it's tough sometimes when you've only got 30% FTE of someone's time and you've got a full-time project. So we just keep shuffling that around to the extent that we can. Um, it gets challenging when someone who's wearing three hats and managing three different types of programs leaves, and then how do you rehire that? Um, so that's, that's definitely a question. And as I said, we use quality interns to supplement this project-based effort. So a lot of our intern projects, you know, our farm employment directly is entirely an intern project. We have interns help us with resource guides and, you know, land matching programs, all kinds of things. We really integrate them and give them meaningful work to do. Um, and the other thing that I've found over the years is not to be afraid of recharacterizing something that you're doing as new and different with a twist. I mean, there's always something that I feel like we're always innovative and in, in looking and getting feedback from our participants and staying close to the ground about things. There's always something new that you can say that you're doing to a certain extent or a new partnership or a new program area that you want to find and grow. So we've been able to recharacterize those things to different funders over the years to keep things going. And diversity is the best policy. So as I said, we've been heavily weighted on government grants for a very long time. When we had that um, delay because of our lovely Congress and a big gap in the Farm Bill programs, all those federal grants we'd relied on, it was a huge hit to our budget. We knew we needed to diversify, but that really kept us um, on our toes. So I've done my best over the years to cultivate an entrepreneurial spirit among staff to, you know, I'm not trying to, I, I started my career in a consulting firm where every hour was billable. I'm not that militant here, but I just want, you know, staff need to know that obviously their, their jobs, we have to bring in their salaries like everything else. We need to do a good job, um, be honest with our funders, um, have good results, do meaningful work with our clients, and that will hopefully pay for itself over time. Um, as long as we can cultivate those good relationships. And then, as I said, uh, I like to empower our staff to say, um, to give them a lot of ownership um, over their work. So basically them helping with writing their own grants to fund their work is writing their own work plan and job description. So that helps me get support for grant writing. It also helps them um, really, and us as an organization, to stay true to the work that we want to be doing. And then if folks have good quality boards and advisors and donors, um, we formed a development committee around our fundraising events. They invite their friends, um, and then you just continue to engage people in the work. And, you know, we all have to love fundraising to succeed in this work. So that's my spiel. Happy to take some questions and conversation. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that very much. And just as a reminder to everybody, if you have any questions, the chat box is the best way. Um, so feel free now to put any questions in there. And Chris was able to stay on, so he is still here. So if you had a question from the first presentation, um, you're welcome to ask that as well at this point.
do we scare everyone away? <laughs> Not sure. We're also happy uh, to answer questions about um, sort of more generally about CFP if you have questions about that. So feel free um, to ask questions about the grant program in general. Um, we're happy to answer those as well. Well, it doesn't seem as though any questions are coming through. So um, you have Jennifer's contact information there. Um, mine, uh, I will put mine, type mine into the chat box right now as well so that if questions come up, you are welcome to uh, reach out. All right, well, I want to say a big thank you to both of our presenters today, um, uh, both to Chris and Jennifer. I appreciate both the, the really specific look at Chris's, um, at Alba's work, and then the sort of broad overview from New Entry. Um, and I appreciate all of you being on the webinar today. Um, I hope that you're able to uh, take some of this away with you and bring it back into your programs, either in your current CFPs or in your applications. And again, if you're either an applicant or a grantee, um, we're here to support you in a lot of different ways. So feel free to reach out, um, take a look at our website, see what we have available for you. Um, and just wanted to say thank you to all of you.